we've slipped the schedule by about 10 minutes. Oh, hope you don't have anywhere to go right away. <laughs> um, at this time, I'm going to bring up uh, this guy. Uh, you might have seen him around when he, he used to work at Cadence, and then, and then, we, then he moved over to Mentor for a little while. Then he spent some time at, at uh, Apple, but now he's here at Amazon, and so we're going to have Umar come up and greet you all. Umar Shah. Like really happy to see everybody. Uh, so many people, you know, I've, I've either worked with or you know uh, worked for when I was at uh, in my EDA career. So thank you so much for coming. We're honored to host the uh, Silicon Valley IPC chapter meet. Uh, there was a lot that went on behind the scenes to uh, you know make this happen. Um, I love you know learning and sharing information. You know, um, so this is going to be a great. Uh, great uh, meeting. Um, uh, thank you very much to Altium for you know presenting and bringing the lunch. Uh, with that said, I'm going to have uh, Chuck Rush, who is a senior manager who runs the PCB engineering group here at Lab 126, come in and welcome you as well. Chuck. Hi, Chuck. Hi, Chuck. Hey, everybody. participation in the IPC Council and uh, I want to thank Bob again for his you know faithfulness to the IPC Council his dedication here as well um, I also want to thank Altium as well for you know being here today presenting to us as well as uh, the food so um, as uh, as Umar introduced me I am a manager here at lab 126 and uh, I manage a department called cred it's not the most beautiful uh, acronym for a name in the world, but uh, uh, we are a, a group uh, that involves component resources and electrical design. That's kind of the acronym for CRED. And uh, my team is made up of uh, four uh, distinct functional groups, including component engineering, uh, symbol modeling engineering, layout engineering, as well as uh, DFX engineering. And so I manage <coughs> two people here. So um, Amazon, how many of you are Amazon.com customers? Do we have any in here in the room? <laughs> so most of you are familiar with Amazon, of course. Uh, how many of you may have, be a user of an Amazon uh, device product? Yeah, most of you. So, this is Amazon Lab 126. Amazon, uh, here at Amazon Lab 126, uh, we've been in existence for about 15 years. Um, and so we design all of the Amazon device products that you would typically see on the Amazon banner when you go into their home page and up at the top of the banner, they'll typically have Amazon devices like Kindle ebook readers. Fire TVs, the Echo Alexa product line, uh, as well as uh, tablets. And so most of those products are designed here at Lab 126. They're all consumer electronic products. Amazon has been in existence uh, this month, July, uh, 24 years. And uh, Amazon Lab 126 has been around for 15 years. It took three years to design the very first ebook reader, Kindle Generation 1, and uh, now it takes us approximately 9 to 12 months to design any other product after that, and some of them are on even shorter cycle development times than that. I've been with Amazon for uh, <coughs> almost 12 years, so I've got a lot of history with Amazon Lab 126. I've been involved here with uh, designs you know, in all of those different product lines that I just mentioned. Uh, it's a very quick and fast-paced environment here at Amazon. Uh, and so when, when people come here, and we're so glad that you know, many, many people do come here, it's a fast-paced environment and we work very quickly, but we have a lot of fun. Uh, and we're very happy to be able to host today, and uh, we thank you for coming here and uh, participating. So that's all that I have, and... Uh, Thanks a lot.
So I have a few more things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, uh, few more thank yous from my side uh, to Bob. Uh, Bob and I go uh, back a long time, and Bob's always reached out, and I've reached out to Bob, and you know we have a uh, good thing going on here, and because of Bob, this event is happening today. I'd also like to thank you, uh, thank uh, Brian, who has been escorting everybody. He's the manager who runs the library here uh, for front end and back end for Lab 126. And I'd also like to um, thank my management, uh, Jake Boswell, who's sitting over there. So Jake, you can raise your hand. Um, I am part of the uh, licensing infrastructure, infrastructure processing methodology team under Jake. So thank you very much for uh, allowing me to give me the time to manage this event, and you know. All right, thanks a lot, Omar. Thank you. <coughs> so say, uh, at this time now we're going to go around the room. We can do the general introductions. You already met Umar, and Vince will be introducing him a little bit more later. So we'll go here. My name is Vince. Oh, let me help you out. I got a. <clears throat> There. <laughs> My name is Jose Camara. I work at 4C, start up back east. Uh, I use Alkin primarily, so, you know, for PCB. And very much variety type of designs, you know, digital or imaging, uh, small, thermal things. So. Okay. Uh, Carl Shafke with Tesla. I am primarily using the Altium tools and um, do a lot of different types of designs, microprocessor based designs, power electronics designs, uh, RF designs, uh, multi-layer or uh, complex, all different uh, sorts of designs, um, love design. Uh, my name is Judy Warner, I'm the director of community engagement at Altium. I'm sort of a, a cheerleader for designers in the industry. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about that yeah, later. We're hear more from you. So yeah, I'll, I'll save that for later. Uh, Pete Fernandez, I work here at Amazon. I am the PCB DSS engineer from the east side of the district. Okay. I'm Steve Levy, I work at X. I uh, use Altium tables in the iPad and uh, <coughs> designs run all over the place. Let me come back and see it. And Alex Corrine with uh, Top Gun Positioning. We uh, use our CAD capture and CAD layout for uh, power and control boards for uh, heavy equipment positioning and um, survey things. Okay. Uh, Brian Truex. I, I work at uh, Amazon here in the tech center. I'm an engine design trainer. <coughs> Jorge Paredes, Tesla. <coughs> I use Cadence Labor and Alto. Uh, that was designed with some HDI boards. I'm Laura Diego. I work in the Northwest West West Division. I'm designing and making robots and running boards and powering boards. I'm Terry Christian, also the same for graphics. Uh, mostly working with expedition hyperlinks and gallery stickers and the design types that we support kind of include everything. Everything, yes. <laughs> Small, very big to know. Right. <coughs> Jason and Apple with Silicon Science Solutions for the Internet and the Security Center for the DRC. I'm Jason Espinoza. I'm the PCB Technology Manager at Vista Networks. And we use Kaden for Libra. And uh, we design it. Our main product is data center switches, but we have everything from like the layer and switches down to like the you know, data layers. Hi, my name is Rosemary Brown, and I'm with the Chuck um, group <coughs> as well, working at Amazon um, in layout engineering using Kevin design. Okay. 
David Gonzalez, I've been at Amazon under Chuck for four weeks. <laughs> and uh, worked at Marvell Semiconductor before that for 11 years, designing uh, solid state drives and validation hardware for the drive controllers. Good. Using the Lego. The Lego. John Lewis, or depending on Lou Mako. We do banking and financial security and products, general purpose hardware security modules. Uh, primarily using all three. Uh, Tom Wozniki, Flex Circuit Design Company. Uh, I use both Altium, uh, Allegro, and AutoCAD, and a boutique program called Electronic Packaging Designer. And my specialty is flex circuits from very teeny tiny ones all, all the way up to very large companies. I'm Hans Schiesel with Shenmue Technologies in Taiwan. We are going to solve the material manufacturer and we solve your interconnect problems. Okay. Um, I'm Malcolm Lee. Um, my company is Saiyan Technologies. I design everything from the concept, I do the layouts, I do the 3D drawings, I do the whole work, I do the final test. Um, so I do many roles, but my specialty is microwave RF. Um, I do also power supply, uh, very high frequency supply, then it's all light supply, and many other things. Okay, let's, let's run down that wall now. <coughs> Dave from uh, Western Digital. Um, you probably built your Android. I do uh, work in the research group, so we're not actually doing Android right stuff. Um, it's, yeah, lots of big things, lots of fast things. So we use Cadence for the primarily brown ale. Hi, my name is Chase Bossel. I manage the design technology team here at Amazon. That's um, all of our engineering software tools, data management, systems infrastructure, etc. Uh, we use a little bit of everything. It's primarily Cadence uh, and the devices we are here with Bruce, supporting tools across. Yeah, Dan Adler, uh, Google, uh, from the Pixel team, and doing flex for the uh, Red Oak. Uh, and Dan was here for quite some time. Come home. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, hi, my name is DJ. I'm part of the Jared. I work for Jared Richards, and I had some of the My name is Joel Lawson. I am also with Zero Circuits, and we are here to document this awesome event. Thank you. We're going to come back and talk about Sierra later on today. Uh, Let's jump back here. My name is Andy Carrasco, uh, Cisco Systems. Uh, we primarily use uh, Linux tools and Ruby on SIP, uh, and also I use PD. Uh, and I'm involved in developing and finding out uh, how to run the same device. Hello, I'm Aaron Hanks, uh, Applications Engineer with Cadence Design Systems, and yeah, all types of designs to support. Okay. Right. I'm John Zori, owner and sole proprietor of Corporate Engineering Services. Been doing board layout for 40 plus years, and my tool is PAD. <clears throat> I'm Ben Leslie, I'm a Features Design Manager at Google Net. All right, and we just had somebody walk in. What, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm uh, Robert Flores. I'm a uh, sales manager for a company called Amazon Circuits and Electronic Manufacturing Service Company. And uh, I was sent here by the CEO, Joe, uh, Joe O'Neill, uh, who had something come up. So thank you for having me. Okay. <laughs> That's too bad. I wanted to talk to you. Today. Okay, so now we would go into, normally go into um, chapter business, but I got something special for you. I'm going to bring up Stephen Golim. How did you say that last name? Golemi. Golemi. He's the co-chair of the IBC 2231 DFX Design for Excellence Standards Committee. He currently works at X, the Moonshot Factory, formerly known as Google X. 
as an internal consultant coaching teams on DFX principles, solving unusual printed board challenges, establishing supply chains and engineering development processes for new projects, and researching new printed board technologies. Project X is include Makani, Loom, and Robotics. Prior to working at X, he developed robotics and engineering energy systems at Jet Propulsion Lab, Q, Shilling Robotics. I'm, I'm, I'm screwing it up. <laughs> anyway, he graduated from USC with degrees in electronic, electrical engineer and business. So he's going to come and talk about his committee that he's involved in. So. <clears throat> Yeah, I guess you can. Is this uh, HDMI? Maybe? Yeah, you can. Yeah, this one's probably easier. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Awesome. No? Yeah. <clears throat> here for a second. All right. <clears throat> cool. So uh, I'd like to apologize. Um, my computer has a text out for two and a half hours, and so you'll just have to have me manually scroll everything. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a brand new IPC standard that's released uh, in end of May. Um, IPC releases one free standard per site, so you can still get this for free in the next couple of weeks if you email them. Uh, I highly encourage you to get the free standard. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I primarily do what I wanted to do as a kid, which is play with giant moving integrated systems, namely robots specifically, and then power systems. So I got to work on the Mars Science Laboratory, I've got to work on autonomous jet skis, which is super fun, uh, deploy uh, solar systems in Africa, which was very unusual, that was actually really high volume uh, and long life, and uh, some uh, benthic coring systems, and then uh, robotics for the energy sector. Um, that was before my current job. There we go. So right now we work for X. Uh, X, we brand ourselves as the Moonshot Factory. We're trying to find the next big thing that can radically make the world a better place, as well as move Alphabet's needle, which is incredibly hard. It's a big needle. Um, so I've worked at uh, Makani, which is uh, flying wind turbines, uh, Loon, which is the internet balloons, um, as well as uh, robotics projects. Um, I'm an internal consultant there. So uh, basically, IPC 2231 uh, is a standard that's meant to help design teams uh, reinforce design for excellence principles and making sure that they're set up to make the highest quality designs as fast as possible. <coughs> so the principles that the standard currently tackles is fabrication, assembly, test, cost, reliability, reuse, and environment. Um, the primary purpose is to go fast and improve quality. We all want designs yesterday, and we all want them to work and be fit for application. Uh, so, uh, to go fast, uh, you're going to need a well-communicating a well team. Uh, you're going to want to reduce revisions to the point where you're not stuck in never releasing that revision. It's always a balance I think uh, we all play. Um, finding fixed issues earlier, ideally when they're in bits before we turn them into atoms. Uh, align resources and reduce delays. Um, improve quality is we want to make sure we can uh, hold our suppliers accountable. <laughs> And we also uh, communicate uh, precisely across our entire organization exactly what we want. Um, so IPC 2231 uh, lays out a design process that's uh, currently a waterfall process in six major phases. Uh, concept and design analysis, uh, detailed design, release, build support, validation, and then field support. Um, I, I think, uh, at least I've worked for a few startups now, uh, a lot of people end designs at design release. Um, <coughs> I'm sure folks in this room have worked on those types of teams before. And um, that creates a lot of problems downstream. And if you're not in the concept phase thinking about support and product validation, um, you're really shooting yourselves in the foot and you're going to be in this endless cycle of revision and delay. Um, that's it. I only got a few minutes. I hope I uh, did OK. Um, basically, uh, the standard's free for two weeks, one per site. So just email IPC uh, if you're a member. Um, you can take a course, so I'll be teaching a course with uh, Doc Brown of ANSYS, uh, formerly uh, Design for Liability Solutions, at uh, SMTAI. And then uh, we're arranging a course at Apex Expo 2020, but we haven't quite figured out the exact date yet. Uh, they usually release the schedule in October. Um, you can join our committee, so we released it. Um, we recognize there's a lot of problems with it. Um, so tell us the problems, and let's work together and fix it. 
basically the primary purpose of the standard is to get everyone here in a room together and talk about how can we make design better? How can we make this process better? How can we move the industry forward? Um, also, you're welcome to uh, check out my website. Uh, you can add me on LinkedIn. Um, and there's a form I send out a couple of one to two emails a month on basically what's the latest and greatest in design. Thank you very much. Questions? Is that downloadable for designer council members? Um, so uh, IPC licenses, uh, the, they make their money on basically licensing the standard. So you can get a hard copy, which I have. Um, you're welcome to, to look at it, but I need it back. Or you can download buy a download copy where it's a single DRM restricted to a device. Um, uh, the, the standard is actually pretty cheap. It's forty-seven dollars, but if you request the free one, you know it's zero dollars. My favorite price. If you're an IPC member. So Steve, can we have you come back in a future meeting and give us more in-depth going down the road? Absolutely. All right. And I can't wait to get all your feedback on how we can make the standard even better. All right, what do you guys think? We'll have them come back and stay yeah. Very, yeah. Very, yeah. Good. very good. Thank you very much. All right, very good. So now we're going to go to what we call the sponsor spotlight. And for that, we're going to bring up Judy, who is the uh, Director of Community Engagement at Altium. Yeah. Okay, I'll start talking while you see if you can find my slides. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you to Amazon for hosting and for Bob and the whole committee here. I have supported your chapter for two years since I joined um, Ultium about two and a half years ago, but I've never had the pleasure of being in your company. So um, it's a delight to meet you. I see some familiar faces. So. It's a delight to be here. So, one more back. Yes. Okay, so luckily for you, I'm not an all team salesperson, <laughs> so you won't hear an interview of that from me. So, I just wanted to share with you um, first my background. So, I have been in the electronics industry since 1983 ish. Um, and I, what I did for, the, for basically 25 years, there were some years off raising kids in there is I sold to and worked with PCB designers. Um, I, worked, I worked for manufacturers and assembly shops, and I worked with service bureaus. So I was sort of in the weeds with you telling you, use this solder mask, not that solder mask. If we trim up this rail, you can get more up on a panel. Your stack up should look like this. So I, I have an affinity and affection for designers because I feel like I've been in the weeds with people like you for most of my career. So. Altium hired me because they were a little detached from their users, and so I was hired to sort of be a bridge between Altium and their designers and the other way around. So one of the things they asked me to do was, hi Judy, welcome to Altium, can you please start a users group in two countries in like six months? Sure. So thus Altium Live was born. <coughs> and again, from my worldview, I don't really think so much in terms of tool alliance is I just think I stand for designers. I think your work is very admirable. I think sometimes you get overlooked and I think it's a really hard job and DFX, good Lord, that's hard. So um, luckily I have some really cool friends because I'm very social and outgoing. So this is the lineup of uh, keynotes and people that will be speak, speaking at Altium Live. I invite each and every one of you, October 9th through 11th, uh, Lowe's Coronado Bay. It's right on the bay in Coronado. It's gorgeous. And the keynotes in this group are Eric Bogatin, Robert Ferranic. Who knows Robert Ferranic? Anybody? Some of you do. Anyways, he's a YouTuber and he teaches Cadence and Altium. Um, but just PCP design online, he's quite a little um, famous guy. Joe Grand who is a hacker, hardware and software engineer, who was on a, a Discovery Channel a series called Prototype This that was made by the producers of Mythbusters. So he's a very interesting guy. And Bob Martin, who they call the Wizard of Make, he is from Microchip, and he's an Arduino guy, and 
really great about how to prototype quickly using the Arduino platform. And then Rick Hartley, post most of you probably know if you're attending PCB West, he's going to do a full day class on EMI and noise control. And then Gary Ferrari, who actually started the IPC Designers Council, is going to do a full day on DFM. So um, I, am, I invite you to join us. I just click right. Thank you. Um, this is kind of an outline. So what I've tried to do is make this so you wouldn't feel like a trader if you worked on largely on, on a on a mentor or cadence tool. But you could come here and still learn a lot of stuff and not feel like it was a thinly veiled sales pitch. Or yeah, this is a place to learn and not just about tools. So there's three days. The first day is optional, and that's where we talk about uh, tools. This is where we talk about Altium-centric courses. But if you don't want to take that, then you can take Rick's class or Gary's class. The other two days, we have industry keynotes. We have professional development courses that are agnostic for the most part. I mean, we'll be demoing in our software, but it's still just design principles. And then we'll have user presentation and supply chain. So I'm very passionate about DFM having come from the board industry and work with folks like you. There is the, I don't know if you're going to probably share your slides after. There's the link if you would join us. Um, registration's now open. One of the funnest things we do is we do a robot build and battle. First we open a bar. <laughs> and we have beer. And then we have y'all build robots, and it becomes, as you can see, total mayhem later, but it is a blast. Right, Carl? Carl's yes. been there many times. And the second thing I wanted to share with you, okay, is that um, I have the pleasure of hosting a podcast that is for PCB designers, and um, we talk about really DFX, right? Designed for everything. So I bring in thought leaders like the Rick Hartleys and the Dan Beakers and the Eric Bogatins. I bring all those people in, but then I bring in Sierra Circus. I just did a podcast with Sierra Circus. Talk about what can designers do better to get their board out quicker, cheaper, more reliably, right? So DFM. I'll bring in assembly shops, I'll bring in material scientists, people who know about solder mask or surface finishes. So um, again, tool neutral. So I invite you to subscribe. It's on iTunes, Stitcher, all your favorite podcast apps. Oh, and you can also, um, we also film it on video and on audio. So you can either if you're not a podcast person, we also have it in video format. So thank you so much for your time, and thank you for having me. Thank you. I have subscribed to the podcast, and I listen to the one with Ahmed. Hey. You guys kind of bonded a little bit there? Well, like, we're kind of old friends, but we, we had a blast. And then also the one with uh, Ben Jordan, yeah, who we had here before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have more time than most people do. I'm going to turn it over to you now. All right, thank you very much, Judy. So now we're going to go into our feature presentation, and I bring to you Vincent Hemp. He's the lead PCB designer at Electronic Systems at Tesla Incorporated. Before that, he did 23 years as senior staff engineer at Alcatel and later at STM or ST Microelectronics. He is now mainly focusing on making the next generation of electronics possible. Part of that was getting, setting up and maintaining the central library in the vault, as well as building in-house tools to implement the desired functionality. I mean, he does some really great stuff over there. It really helps us out with our, with our layout stuff. He's also an author of a few books and holds a number of patents. Vince, it's up to you. All right. Thank you, Bob. So, like Bob said, I, I'm... I've been in the industry for quite a long while, originally from the semiconductor uh, part, so not so much PCB design, but chip layout. And after playing with sand for 20 years, I thought it's time to do something else and go and take a look at doing more and more board design. 
So uh, Tesla has been, I started as a, as a board designer and then we had the idea about four years ago that we should, should bring in a product that um, Altium is um, uh, making, which is an Altium Vault, which basically allows you to manage symbols, footprints, but also whole designs. And the Vault has a couple of capabilities where you can link it into purchasing, PLM, lifecycle management, uh, uh, design, um, version control, and, and a whole bunch of other things. And as I've set that up and, and learned how to interact with all these other tools, the engineers came to me and said, well, we also want to interact. We want to exchange um, PCB layout or PCB files, not just spitting out Gerber or DB++ to give it, get it manufactured, but we want to send it into a simulation tool. Um, tools like uh, CST Studio to do uh, uh, um, power analysis or impedance, impedance analysis and or mesh with the, the, the mechanical world either through step or through IDF, IDF files where you can have a live connection with, with other pieces of software. So there's a whole universe out there that um, beyond the PCB design and you're going to run into very weird, weird problems if you don't set up your data right in your design. And some things are really, really far-fetched. Um, I'll cover one, one item in, in specific that happened a couple of months ago and took quite a long time to figure out, and it turned out to be a European versus US problem. <laughs> but I'll come back, to, come back to that later. So there's three, there's three <clears throat> big uh, things. You have three big problems that you're going to deal with if you're going to be preparing data or massaging data for handoff and interconnection with other pieces of software. First of all, there's a man-machine interface because your engineer is going to scribble something down on a paper napkin and, and hand it to somebody who will have to capture a schematic. Then you have a big problem, which is typically your machine-machine interface because you're working in a specific tool set that is running on a specific operating system and that has to communicate data to other tools that may or may not run on the same operating systems. And there's going to be things that will get lost in translation because of those issues. And then the last thing is ultimately you have a man machine you have a machine to man interface. Somebody at some point in time outside of your control, outside of your company or outside of your design world is going to look at your design and that may be on a paper copy or it may be a NAT list that was sent out or it may be a pick and place file with some names in it and he's going to have questions or when they are importing your files the import fails because of some weird character that lives in your file and their tool set cannot cope with okay so the goal of what I'm going to describe here is to minimize these kind of issues and tell you the things that I've run into and, and sort of give you a guideline of what to avoid in your design to not run into communication problems whether it is with other machine or other software or with people. So let's take a look at component values and this is the thing that I was alluding to. If you look at 1,000 is not the same as 1,000 because in Europe, the comma is the period in US. So that first number in Europe is actually 1, not 1,000. Okay? So that is a problem. And what happened is this happened in Germany. Somebody had a big database with, with part values and part numbers and whatever. And their server is set up with a European locale. So Windows, or whatever server platform, doesn't matter if it's Linux, understands that I am in Europe, the comma is the period. So he was exporting files and sending them over the Atlantic, where they got imported by another tool, and they changed three orders of magnitude in value. <laughs> of course, when they powered up the board, the magic smoke escaped. <laughs> so that is a very dangerous thing. You have to be aware of that. Worse. They were doing something actually with the Altium vault, and when they sent the files back, 
the Oracle server that was supposed to pull the data in just plainly crashed because it was getting the data back and it said, these are not numbers to me. Because they had, they, they were using engineer, the engineering power, so 1.1 E minus 06 as opposed to one microfarad. So they used the engineering format and the input parser in Oracle couldn't parse that string as a number and it just barfed. <laughs> and then they go like, well, what do we do now? Well, the changer will call to you and the problem goes away. That's easily said. That's easier said than done. It's not an easy process to do that because you're bucking up the whole database. So these are things that you have to be aware of um, when, you, when you're going to be dealing with data. So most of us are familiar with, with the writing format where you, you just don't use the periods, but you use the units or you use the multiplier like me, mega, kilo, uh, and whatever to, to format your numbers. That is sometimes referred to as the spice format because the, the spice simulators do understand that numbering format. They do understand if they read 4M7, that is 4.7 mega ohm. Okay? So <coughs> some parsers, when they're translating strings into numbers, they stop at the first character that is not a number. So if you're going to feed in 2,2 2 microfarad in a, into a parser, into a machine that is US-based, it's going to say, well, comma, that's, not, that, that's where I stop. I terminate there because that is the first non-numerical numeric, character. And your 2.2 your, your, uh, your microfarad can become even a 22 microfarad because it just rejected that comma and said, I'm going to keep on uh, parsing it, or I'm going to stop and make it 2 microfarad, which are both wrong. So trailing zeros, some people um, use a trick where they say, oh, we're going to encode values into our system. If it's a 1%, two trailing digits. If it's a 0.1%, three trailing digits. What if the dot disappears? Your tra every trailing digit becomes a, an order of magnitude of error that you're injecting in your system. Don't do trailing zeros. <laughs> It's it's a it's a it's a big problem. It, it could potentially be a problem. Um, special characters, ohms and mu. Well, not all phones and not all machines have those characters. If you have a, a an, an old pick and place machine that is being run by still running on a DOS based system that is using the ASCII codes, there is no ohms and mu in ASCII. So it's going to get some binary representation in there that it will not know how to handle and it may it may not crash but it's going to raise issues on the operator and you're going to get a phone call we're having trouble reading your files don't do those things just use r uh, for instead of ohms r for resistance or if it's like a ferrite bead where it's complex impedance use z um, if instead of mu just use the, the letter u Okay, and then capitalization is another big thing because a lot of a lot, some tools, when they are importing strings, they for, for ease of processing they, they capitalize everything, so your 22 milliohms becomes 22 mega ohm resistor. So it's better off to write that as a zero R zero twenty two because then that is not going to happen. So you should you should be careful when you're playing with with <coughs> uh, multipliers mega, kilo, giga, and then dividers, which are the micro, pico, nano, whatever, that they, do, they, they don't scale the wrong way because of capitalization. So the golden rule is don't use any periods or don't use any commas. You won't have any locale problems. Um, we're going to restrict ourselves to the SI system, uh, but we're going to be a little bit more um, doing a little bit more filtering. We're only going to use multiples and fractions of a thousand, which are what they call the engineering numbers. Power, <coughs> power of three, six, minus three, minus six, and so on. So giga, mega, kilo, and then unit is going to be R for resistance, F for farad, and stuff like that. Milli, we're not going to use because if we capitalize milli, it becomes mega. So we can kill that one off. Micro, nano, pico, femto. Okay, so officially for SI, the multipliers are, are supposed to be uppercase, with the exception of kilo and hecto and deca, which we don't use in electronics. Um, and then the divider should be should be lowercase. So I filter my um, my multipliers or dividers in such a way that there is no possibility for ambiguity. There is no reuse 
of the letter, whether it's uppercase or lowercase. So if something happens during translation, the intent is not lost. The parser is not going to parse it the wrong way. It's not going to get translated in something I do not want. Okay? So, and I give you a couple of examples. So 1M8, that means mega. There's not going to be no confusion with millios because 0R022, it's still going to be 22 millios. If I write down 0F022, that's a 22,000 microfarad capacitor. Don't write 22 millifarad because it could become a 22 megafarad, which doesn't exist. But just as an example, if you if you make sure that there is no no possibility for ambiguity, you're not gonna you're not gonna run into kind of weird things like this. Hmm. No, because far farads are unit farads ohms. Uh, volts and pairs are units, where these are multipliers. So if you have zero, if there is twenty-two, how do I know that twenty-two hundred microfarads are not ten to two years or a thousand picofarads? Well, okay. So the parser is going to the parser is going to hit the first f. Use that one as the period, and the moment it hits the second f, it's going to terminate. Oh, I see. So. So because you can't that, have two periods in the number, so that the, the, the so computer what you're part is that the multipliers go with the unit. The Correct. The, mul the, the multiplier replaces the period or the comma, right. and then the units are optional. So three centofarad, you have to put two f. Yeah, you, well, so yeah. you would encode it if it's, it's if it's like 30, 33 femtofarad, it would be 33 ff. If it's 3.3 femtofarad, it would be 3 f3, and you ditch the last f. You don't, you don't typically, you don't, you don't write, because you you're already... you 3 f, how do you know it's 3 farad or 3 femt or something else? Because the first, because the first f that's yeah, going to, that the first f you're going to encounter is going to be your period. If you think about it, if you write 33 FF, it becomes 33 period farad. So it is not lost. It only has one F to be fair. If it's only, yes, but you're not going to write 33. You're not going to write 33 farad. Your intent is 33 femto farad, right? So if you write 33 with a single F, that F, actually, that's a good one. <laughs> okay, who do, deals with femtofarads anyway? <laughs> but yeah, you have a point there. So there is there is another another scope there for an ambi possible ambiguity. I think this is the gene spice notation has been defined right, since the early nineties. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but people still write it as ten point zero kilo ohm. They don't write it as, as 10k0 or 10k05. They write 10.05k and then when it gets translated, you get into issues. And it's, the, I mean, it's not just Spice, there's, there's many other tools. Uh, what about secondary parameters? I mean, capacitors have working voltages, resistors have tolerances and wattages. Same thing, um, you know. Don't do the thing with the trailing zeros. Just encode these as additional parameters to your part. Um, what did I encode that with the, the, the you know the fractional notation as opposed to 0 0.33 watt or 0 0.125 watt? Um, because then there's no confusion possible if you have a print. If you're looking at a printer, the schematic where the numbers are written on a piece of paper. Well, it says 0 0.125. Is that the value of the resistor or is that the wattage? If it's written as a fraction, it's very clear that that is not a, a, a resistance value. We're talking about the wattage. So I'm trying to make a, a graphical distinction there. Uh, file names. That's a biggie. Because ultimately, whatever you're doing in your design, Everything that you do, whether it's making a schematic symbol or a footprint or a, or a schematic or a board layout or a simulation model or a data set, it all ends up in a file, whether in the file system or in a database somewhere. 
where it has to be able to be re retrieved. And there's problems with that. Okay. And this is one that I have personally run, in, ran into. Um, I, when I create a part, you know, I have an encoding mechanism that I use. What kind of part it is, who makes it, and then the part number. And there is a transistor made by NXP called the BC847 slash B, which denotes the, the gain. There's an A and B and a C. So I named the part, gave that part a name, and when I go to commit that into the file system, which is running, is an Oracle filing system um, running on some Unix machine somewhere, it decides to create a subdirectory called transistor NXP BC847, and it creates a file called b.schlib, because it interpreted the slash as a path. So they were taking, they, it was taking the, the name of the part, and it was adding .schlib at the end to make the file name. The problem was I'm running on Windows where um, the backslash is a path indicator, but on Unix, the forward slash is a path indicator. So when it was committing to the file system, it was committing to, um, I believe it was called forward slash library, forward slash, Filing. That is how they built the output string for the file. So the, the file ended up called b.schlib in some subdirectory that the system couldn't handle. So when I tried to access that file, it said file not found. Well, I just committed it. Where is my file? So I had to go and dig in the filer and find out that what is this weird subdirectory that has been created. Well, because the way that it was being parsed by the system, it thought that it had to create a subdirectory. It was an inadvertent thing that happened, but if you if you're gonna be you know you don't always know how the systems work. You don't know how how and what your software is doing, how it's interacting with with storage, and you can run into very very crazy things. So be aware that don't use backslashes, forward slashes, periods, double periods because they are path indicators for operating systems. So you can go up a path, down a path. Create a subdirectory. Um, don't use stars and question marks because those are wild cards for operating systems, and they will. If you try to feed them a file name with a star or a question mark, they're just not going to do anything. You may get an error that you will never see on your screen. Your data is lost because it couldn't be created. Uh, percentage could be a symbolic link. Code could be a volume indicator. It could end up instead of in your C drive, it could end up in a hard disk that doesn't exist, or if the drive letter happens to exist somewhere, you can't find it. Um, and then also be careful because it's not just file systems. If you have the triangular brackets or the round brackets, those could be HTML, XML, or JSON. If your, your data may actually go into a database that is XML based or JSON based, and if you've got something encoded in these brackets, the machine may think that, oh, there's an instruction for me here for, to do something. And it's going to barf at you. And the problem is that your, your software that you're using may not understand that there could be stuff coming back from the other side. You're never going to see an error message. You're never going to see a pop-up. But your data is in limbo. You go to get it, can't find it. And then the problems start. So, the rule that I impose for myself is be language agnostic. Don't do any letter decoration, you know, because the French have three, three kinds of E's with the, the, all the little accents, but your neighbor in, in Germany doesn't have that one, but he has a U with an umlaut with two codes. And then if you're, exchanging, if you're exchanging files with him, then you get problems over there. Don't do that. Restrict yourself to alphanumerics, and underscores and hyphens, those are safe. Anything else is wishy-washy. Stay away from that. Uh, so symbol names, there's a, there's a couple of problems in you know, my, my role as a librarian. I don't want to make 25 of the same symbols for an op amp. I like to reuse symbols and footprints as much as possible. So the problem is that you know there's no standard for naming um, schematic symbols, as there is for IPC has for footprints, there is no such thing for 
naming a symbol. So what are you going to do with that if you want to you know, reuse as much as possible? You're going to run into problems that multiple vendors make the same part and they all use different suffixes because you're going to buy um, an, an LM741C dash MWC from TI, but the suffix is CM or CMX from a different vendor, but they denote the same package, the same footprint, the same pinning. So there's you can't you can't you have a clear cut line in figuring out how do I bundle these things? What can I reuse? What I cannot reuse? Other problem is that different parts can still have the same symbol because an LM741 or an OP06 or whatever, they all have the same pinning. It's an OPA. <coughs> you know, pin 2 is always going to be negative, 3 is going to be positive, 6 is your output, 7 is your positive rail, 4 is your negative rail. So if you want to make a symbol that you can reuse across multiple parts, how are you going to name it? How are you going to store it? The other thing is that some components, um, like a TL771 OPA, you can get that in multiple packages. You can get that in an SO8, you can get it in a DIP. They're both 8-pin packages, that's fine. But you can also get it in a SOP23 with 5 pins. Then the pin numbers change. Then it's no longer 2 negative input and 3 positive input. Then it becomes, uh, I believe, 4 is the output, uh, 1 and 2 are negative and positive, 3 is the negative rail, and 5 is the positive rail. So what you're going to do now, now your symbol doesn't work anymore. <clears throat> So that's another another issue you gotta be, you know, how do you encode these things and how are you gonna name things so that you don't create ambiguity. So I ditch all the suffixes. Um, you know, you, you adopt a format that allows for flexibility. Part type, manufacturer, part name, and if it exists in multiple flavors, different footprints, you attach the footprint to the end of the name. Um, the footprint is optional because if, if that particular component only exists in one package with a, with a certain pinning, forget about it. If it exists in multiple flavors, you can attach it. So I gave the example that there is an ST743-SO8 and there's also a flavor SO23. The symbols are going to be different because the pinning is different. One pack is five pins, other package is eight pins. Um, have a provision in your library for generics. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna build um, a resistor that's 10k and a resistor that's 5k and, and so on. So you could do this is a resistor generic and in a way of five package. There is a um, generic fusible resistor. There's a generic polarized. There is a generic op amp, single op amp LM741 style. So whenever somebody somebody is looking for, um, I mean, I have to build somebody requesting a new op amp. I'm gonna, it's easy for me to find out, to take a quick peek what I already have available as symbols because I can just launch a search for IC generic op amp single and I'm gonna have a list of all my symbols which are already existing. I can take a quick look if I find what I need in there, point to that one. If it doesn't exist, I create a new one. So it's a matter of being able to very quickly in the library, being able to find um, items and not duplicate things over and over because they become a maintenance headache. Um, and then the same thing, you know, make sure that you sanitize your names for um, file system issues because again, when you're creating these parts, they, they are ultimately going to end up as a file somewhere in a filer and you want to be able to find them and know where the machine is going to dump them. The same thing happens if sometimes you have to export your design um, it's not going to happen with schematic symbols, but for example, if you have a footprint that has a step, that has a 3D model attached to it, the step files also have a name. Be very aware of how those files are named because there may be a request that somebody says, can you get me the full 3D model of the board, including all the step files, because I want to load that in Katia or SolidWorks to mate it with some custom-built heatsink. If you have weird file names in there, the bundle of data that's going to be exported, when you open that in your mechanical tool, it, it may not be able to find certain files because your naming conventions are not proper. That's another thing I've run into. So be, be very aware with how you are naming things because you may think that, oh, it's just an internal name for the tool. 
ultimately it may end up as being a, a file on export. And that's where the misery begins. And if you have to hunt that down, you can lose a lot of time figuring out what happened and solve it in the library so that it propagates. Uh, let's see. Designators, okay? There's actually an IEEE standard on, on designators. Um, and now I'm talking, when we set up the vault, we wanted, it, we wanted to be able to spit out a bill of material that goes into a PLM system. So we track all our procurement, all our part allocation is done in the PLM system. We don't control it in the CAD software. But the, the library is pointing, has a pointer to the PLM system. The PLM system, when it, when it imports, when, it, when we create a link, all we give it is this very simplified bill of material where we tell, tell it R1, R7, R9 is this internal part number. J22, J33 are that part number, and so on. So it's a very, it's a two column list, and all the links are made. The problem is that the PLM systems are, they have quirks in them. So if you are going to, you have, you have a number of switches in your design, and you're gonna set the designators for some of the switches to S and other designators gonna be SW, your PLM system may barf at you because it, it wants to see R1, R2, R3, or S1, S2. It does not, it can't handle S1, SW3. It goes, your designators don't match. This is a different kind of designator, what are you doing? And this is something that I run into with a PLM system called Novia. The, the tool just can't cope with that. It, it, it needs to have on a single line that all the designators need to be the same thing. So you need to be aware when you're, when you're you know, drawing your schematics, don't mix and match designators if they're ultimately going to end up being pointing to the same part number because you're, during import, you're going to run into problems. Um, another one that I've seen uh, problems with is a JK or P4 connector. Now, K is typically, again, across the Atlantic in Europe, K is a connector. Here we use J or P, but when is it J and when is it P? Well, actually, the definition is that J is a jack and P is a plug. And the definition of a jack is defined by IEEE and ANSI as the least movable of a pair. So if you have a board that has a serial DB9 connector, that is, not, that is not the movable part. The movable part is the part that sits on the cable. So the part on the board is J, the part on the cable is P. That's how you differentiate with that. For reference, because this, this is gonna be available for download for anybody who wants it. These are the most commonly used ones and standardized ones by IEEE. Um, even though the last one is not really part of the standard, of the standard but Everybody understands that TP means test point. Because if we're doing a schematic design, that's how you're going to label those things. Um, do stick your fiducial gunny mounting holes. Please do stick them in your schematic. Have them travel with your design. I typically stick an additional schematic sheet somewhere in the design that holds all the mechanicals and all the stuff that is not really electrical, but needs to travel with the design. So when we pull a bill of material out of the design, they're going to be included. All the screws, nuts, washers, bolts, heat sinks, thermal grease, glue, conformal coating, whatever, it sits on a sheet that travels with the design. It is not going to be forgotten when somebody in procurement is going to do a price calculation. They're not going to come back, oh, you forgot to mention that we also need thermal grease in this design. So, things to think about. Footprints. And I'm going to go out on a limb here because IPC has a beautiful naming system, but it's a little bit too extensive and it has a little bit, sometimes it gets abused a little bit. When is it, when is it a SON and when is it a DFN package? Well, if you look at a lot of data sheets from a manufacturer, they will tell you this is DFN 16. There's no such thing as a DFN 16. Because the DFN, by definition, is either two, three, or four pin. It cannot be more than that. That is the definition of a DFN. But a DFN in, in the package in itself 
belongs to the family of solid devices. It's a small outline, no lead. DFN is dual, dual inline, flat, no lead package. So, do you, what are you going to do? Are you going to have in your library both DFNs and SOMs? Hard to search on these things. Um, and then a lot of a lot of kinds, is a lot, and especially with modern packaging, manufacturers are getting very creative, <laughs> coming up with packaging names like WLCSP, which are is basically a QFN with three concentric rows with some things removed and two two thermal pads, one in an L shape and, and a long one. And how do you encode that? There is no way of encoding these things. The standards don't provide for encoding that. Um, you can have the same footprint, or you can have the same package, um, as some 44 pin, and if you buy it from Maxim, the thermal pad is 2x2, two two, and if you buy it from Microchip, the thermal pad is 3x2.5, you have to have that in your library. Fortunately, uh, revision C of the standard, they now have an extension where you can actually do dash T and specify the size of the thermal pads. So those are... You know, um, there is a famous blog by one of the members of the IPC Standards Committee, and there was a heated, heated discussion on packaging name about a year ago, to the point that even he threw up his hands and said, you know, just name, just name your packages as manufactured as man, manufacturer part number and be done with it. This space is cheap. You're not going to run into problems where somebody is uh, substituting a part from Maxim with another part and then that, oh, it's pointed to the wrong footprint, the thermal pad is different. Just hard code them and, and forget about it. And that is always going to, that part is always going to point to that footprint. It's a trade-off, you know. Um, there's other, other things to think about. What if you have part substitutes? Simple transistors 2 and 7002, there's at least 15 companies that make those. They're all sub 23s. The problem is, none of these manufacturers want to pay the licensing rights to actually use a sub 23. So they all make little deviations. There's a couple of companies which are notorious for that. Diode Zinc is one of them. Whenever you are dealing with a, a component that is coming from Diode Zinc, red flag. Read the data sheet very carefully. Because a SOL 23, the pitch between the two pins, the adjacent pins, is supposed to be 0.65. The problem with Diodes Inc. is that they have over the years acquired so many other companies, Cypex, Power Integration, or whatever, that each of these acquired companies, they already had their own molds for SOL 23s. So you're going to buy a part from Diodes Inc. that is classified as a SOL 23. The question is, which mold are they using? They have one mold where the pitch is not 0.65, it's 0.7. Very dangerous. They have salt, salt 323 <clears throat> parts that will not fit on a standard salt 323 footprint because their pins are too long. Be very careful. Read the data sheets very attentively because what the manufacturer calls out as a footprint, it can be anything. There is no rhyme or reason to figure out what they mean. Read the numbers, check out your own database, stay out of trouble. And then the last thing you're going to run into is what about the engineers? Because it's good, as a PCB designer, we all understand that a SOP 65P 280-110, we immediately visualize what that is. Most of the engineers don't know what that is. You tell them, I need an MSOP 8 package. Oh, yeah, we know what that is. They can, those names, click with them because that is what manufacturers have been using in data sheets for so many years. Um, what I typically do when I create a part, you always simply have a common field, spell it out in the common field so they can, they can search for it. Little, little trick. Uh, so for my feeling, there's just too many package name, packaging names. You know, you have MSOP, TSOP, VSOP, QSOP, TSSOP. They're all small outline packages. It's just a pitch that may be different. Um, this the confused ones. DFN, PSON, WSON, SON. They're all SON packages, okay? 
Uh, don't trust the component manufacturers. They will call whatever they want, even if it's totally wrong. TI is notorious for calling things VSOP when it actually maxim MSOPs because they're the same footprint. But and the pinning is just too long to fit on an M, on another on somebody else's MSOP footprint. Um, like I said, there's you know be be very wary of certain manufacturers that. Um, do certain things. Another thing that you sometimes run into, especially with NXP and Infinium, with uh, I've seen it happen on SALT 223s and SALT 89s, the pinning is reversed. Where normally pin, if you look at it, it's a three pin package, <coughs> pin one is, there's one pin at the top, two at the bottom, you would assume that pin one is bottom left. In their data sheet, pin one is bottom right, and it's not a bottom view drawing, it's a top view drawing. They just number them wrong. Be very careful with that because you're going to substitute that part. Somebody's going to say, "Well, we want a second source that, or we want to. I want to just quickly change it in my schematic by, by a part made by somebody else." The pins flip position. Assembly time comes, and the drain and the source just swap <coughs> positions on the board. Correct those things. A lot of transformers do that too. Yeah, uh, and that's another. That's a good point, Carl. Be very wary with the big mechanical things, relays, switches. Transformers, a lot of data sheets show them drawn from the bottom, even though it does not necessarily spell out hard bottom view. They don't always put it in that this is actually a bottom view. You really have to look at, the. they, they typically show you a top a side and a bottom view, and you have to very carefully study it and go like, did they flip it upside down or is it a top view? You can't always tell. They, those those guys are violating a lot of times. I, I ran recently in one, in one of these wrong package of a whole uh -huh. sensor of one two two instead of one yeah. two three and use alting like IPC wizard it it has the option for you to you get, can flip it yeah the yeah. option has there says pin one two three where okay. but it generates the same name part yes so that got gets lost yes so, so that is what I'm saying is that if you find in a data sheet like for a salt eighty nine where they are using a pinning that is not standard in your library translated to standard pinning. Well, the, but that's the, that was the, my dilemma too, because I can either say, okay, this is one, this is two, and this is three. Yeah. But then later on, somebody else gets and goes to that data sheet and starts to make wrong assumptions. Then, so, okay, yes, that can happen. But if you have central one, just name manufacturer and. Yeah, yes, but if you yes. have a centralized library, that's not going to happen because they can't override your pinning. The symbol is hard walk to the footprint. So both the symbol and the footprint have the corrections as per what is standard. Even if the manufacturer is wrong, the translation has happened in the symbol and in the footprint. So on the board, when assembly yeah, time comes, it's going wrong. to be correct and you will be able to substitute such a part for another vendor who has the pinning right. Because a lot of times you need Ultimate the problem is if I name by standard names and it has the inverted footprint, later on somebody comes and, uh, well, we're going to make a I smaller know. for all this and suddenly that one. It's a trade off. Yeah. It's not always easy. I mean, what I'm highlighting here are the possible misery you can run into. In, yeah. in, and the, 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 the bigger point is that if you do have, let's say you have already a SOP 89 in your library. <coughs> what do you do if you have such a footprint with the reverse pinning? Are you going to call it SALT 89 or how are you going to mark it in the library that, hey, this is the one I have, the reverse pinning? Or 89 only... reverse pinning, that's what I want to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, yeah. I know, yeah, but for a, three, always... for a three pin device, there's six permutations. You're going to make all six flavors? Yeah, you always get to that point, write your congressman, you know, make it. <laughs> <laughs> Designed by committee, huh? Yeah, yeah, I know. What happens often is a manufacturer will give you the dimensions, which is all you need to go into the wizard and generate IPC standard mm -hmm. naming and footprints. But they also give you uh, a, a recommended, recommended footprint, which is sometimes very, very fun. different. And then either you follow the manufacturer because they must know they had problems with the standard yeah. and are, you know, sometimes it's something like, Less space and things like that, and you say, okay, this I'll follow the. Yeah, or solar. There's but a lot of, especially with the thermal ones, um, yeah. 
venting is, is typically what, what do you normally do you normally follow the I fo I if they don't recommend any so a lot of manufacturers will actually on their website will have a separate section where they have if you look at like a T TI will call out a, oh this is actually our internal package called DKR you can go to the website search for DKR and they will have an, an, an official mechanical drawing of what that package means for them that will have a footprint in it. If that is available, I use those. I do uh, from not TI, I, I could, but if it's for a tinier company that is not wizard. sure they know that they're doing, uh, you know, what yeah. would you trust? Use the wizard. And, and the other thing is that sometimes, you, you know, even if we use the wizard, you look at the cross section of, you, you, like I had an instance a couple of weeks ago where somebody had a salt. Five two three with with the flat leads, not the gullwing leads, but with the flat lead, and that was a totally new package for me. There's only three manufacturers that use that, so I went to all three manufacturer websites, pulled their recommended footprints, made an overlay of them, and they're all different. And then you come out with the pads that will be able to hold all of them, and that ends up in your library. It is that is the problem because the manufacturers don't care. They go, "Oh, this is a soft twenty three. No, it's not technically." Because SOP 23 is a JDEC name. There is a, you can go there and get that official description. The problem is if you use that one as a manufacturer, you have to pay licensing rights. There's royalties to be. So they just tweak it a little bit. It's a compatible package. Yeah, I come from the semiconductor. We do wizard. that all the time. <laughs> also, a lot of times, D and E are reversed. Have you got into that? And who is, yeah. is that an IPC error? Is that many? That no, error? because IPC actually defines the numbers for the di or the letters for the dimensions. That is standardized, but it's it's uh, but, but manufacturers that, deviate is, from that. Is Altium oh. correct, or is a uh, you know? Have you I paid know, attention to DNA or um, you know that has the If lamp you the there is one that you have to be cautious about. I know that there is one in the wizard. When they have moved to that, okay. uh, yeah, B and and I know. I already figured to get B and put on E and <laughs> most of the time. And that's yeah. what Cross check what is being generated. It's uh, okay. Don't want to keep you guys too long here. So my simplified way is there's two sided and four sided parts. If it's a going, it's a SOP or a QFP. <laughs> If it's an only part, it's a solar QFN. If it's a, a JPIN part, it's an SOG or QLCC. Keeps things simple and easy to find. My old packages are SOD and DO for surface mount and through hole. Transistors are SOT for surface mount and TO for through hole. Keeps it easy to find things. Your syntax becomes very simplified. Um, That's supposed to say four sided. Oops, yeah, that yeah. top right is supposed <laughs> to be four sided. <laughs> <laughs> yes, correct. So you're still, I'm still using the IPC notation, it's just that I'm, I have less prefixes here, which makes my life easier. And I do do the do thing, which is according to what is it, 7351C, where you do dash T and encode the term, the size of the thermal pad in there, because that's a big one. A lot of times when you have um, boards that are coming back from you know, they have yield failures or parts are shifting or whatever, is because the thermal pad on the board does not match the slug in the package. And those slugs are again heavily manufacturing uh, dependent. Because it's dependent on the actual size of the die that is in some microcontroller is a very tiny die, but if it's a big analog device, it, uh, an analog chip, the die with the silicon may be larger, they just need a larger mounting frame. It's still a 44 pin. Uh, QFN, but it just needs a larger frame. So encode those things. Those it's your convention for two by three, the, the Q, X, and Y, but then with a five uh, by three. <laughs> I go uh, length and width. Length first, width, width, width second. Well, what's length? Uh, yeah, the horizontal one is two length. Side, from two side part. Uh, horizontal, horizontal is length. Well, I'll put it this way: the the length is the one that is closest to the side of the Holds pin one. The, the lamp, so the part, the pins are in two lines. <laughs> Even if it's a quad, I always draw my packages pin one top left. Because again, that makes things things easy. It's not like if you're going to change, 
from you know one manufacturer to another, all of a sudden the part of your board rotates when we, everything is drawn uniform. That's the IPC standard. That is the standard anyway. So, well, depending if you're A or B, because they actually allow for both. But and for origin, a, origin in the center. So if you rotate, origin is always in the center. Stays. And wow. the center, the center, I use the Alpium trick where you go, you let the tool figure out where it's basically the center of mass of the copper. It doesn't look at the body, it's the, the center of mass of, of where the pins are. That's what it, actually what they do is the they make the, the smallest, the, they draw the smallest rectangle that can enclose all the copper. They the take the diagonal, the, and that is the center. The center of the bounding box. For copper only. They don't look at silk screen or anything else, it's purely copper only. Okay, let's see. Net names. Another big troublemaker. Okay. Uh, because if your engineer misspelled the net name, <laughs> you're not going to have connectivity. Even worse, if it happens to be a power net, your device will just do nothing, it won't even consume electrons. Uh, keep your name simple, so to avoid confusion, don't use any pluses, minuses, underscores, backslashes to get creative, like, uh, you know, oh, this is an active low signal, so I'm going to call it reset bar, because some tools, a single backslash means the whole word is overstrike. Altium wants a single uh, backslash per letter that needs to be over. <coughs> Overstrike, but unless you have in the options the option turned on that one overstrikes all, and that I have been bitten by that because you go okay I I have my personal setting in Altium as single backslash means the whole word gets overstrike. When you export such a net list, it still has only one backslash. You read it in an Altium installation that had that feature turned off. Only that last letter has the overstrike. That is a different net name now. There's a so, different person who was using Yes, because he had a different setting in the tool, you broke the net list. Don't play with those things. Again, net names, alphanumerics, and that's it. Don't use any decorations, don't use anything because you do not know. Um, I mean, it may not be, you don't, may not be even talking in the same tool. What if you have to hand it off to Spectra? What if you have to hand it off to some other autorator? What if you have to hand it off to some answers or, answers or whatever you do not know what tool. these tools understand and not understand if you keep it simple you're not going to run into, in, into any weird things so you need the underscore n and p for differential that's the only exception underscore correct that is where you're allowed to use an underscore but then and only then otherwise just don't do it yes i work with some like cat packages for example creo has a 31 character file name that's another one. Uh, I noticed like in your file names you have a lot of like names just written out like generic. So again, we do a lot of this and we just have like most abbreviations so it could be like gen. You could do that too. Yeah. Yeah, that is another thing. You know, we have, our PLM system is the same thing. We have so we are actually twenty-four characters. I know, don't ask me. It, that thing is coming from the Unix world and it's French. It's it's annoying. Yeah, actually, it is French. <laughs> it's, it's made by Dassault Systems. It builds airplanes. It makes you wonder. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> so, power nets, also on your, on your power nets, keep stuff simple. You know, positive 3.3 volt analog, negative 12 volt isolation. You know, short net names work fine. No decorators, no, nothing that can possibly be confused by anything or anyone. Another thing is that if you're under using underscores and net names, I don't know if you noticed that, but when you drop that little net name on a wire, that underscore coincides with your wire very beautifully. So then if the question is, is this thing called uh, I score C1 space SDA, or is it underscore SDA? And then the only way to do that is actually go there, move that net text to see what is really there, or copy and paste it. Don't use spaces in that names. The tools allow for it sometimes, just don't do it. It's it's a cause for a headache later on. Well, some truncate too, as soon as they get to a space stop. Yeah, and, that is, saying, and the rest is and bye bye. If you have like three prefixes that are all the same and a different suffix with that space, they're all Boom. the same. Problem. Like, yeah. I've seen people get bit by it. Yeah, and it's just don't just don't do it. 
Uh, it's just nasty bad. Yeah, yeah. And, and like the gentleman, over, uh, like the gentleman over there mentioned, use the underscore only to denote a differential pair. And then again, if that is the syntax that you're, I, I don't know what Cadence uses or, or Orion and Alto uses that underscore p and underscore n. Uh, I don't know what other how other tools do that, but uh, I have to, you know, um, as a little side note, I started with Alpium. PCB layout software when I was still sold as a single 720k floppy RAM and DOS 3.1. It was called <laughs> Autotrax 1.6. <laughs> they didn't even have a schematic tool back then. That was that predated. You had to use Workout Capture to create it at best. <coughs> or Workout SD 286, as it's called back in the day. Uh, so let's see what else is there. Ah, schematics. Another another big problem. Um, clarity in schematics is bad because this is now I'm getting into the man machine world because it's easy you know uh, I see so many because I'm, I'm you know I'm, I'm active on several forums and I've, I've worked with Ben Jordan on circuit maker and, and we've been exchanging things so many schematics you see out there suffer from what I call the internet age they are Arduino style or clearly done by people who have no clue how to draw a schematic because they're, they're, they're just parts with that names glued to their pins. The concept of a wire is or a bus is totally alien to these people. It's just a bunch of random parts with a bunch of nat names and God knows what is wired to what. I can't figure it out. I'd like to see wires. Uh, so top right over here is one of these examples. Yeah, you find a schematic like that, good luck figuring out what is, what is supposed to be connected to what. I can't figure it out. Um, don't do that. Don't use, so many people use net, lab, net labels as a substitute for connectivity. Connectivity is supposed to be draw wires and buses. A net label is you naming a, a piece of connectivity with a specific name. Don't you don't put a net name on sheet one and use the same net name on sheet three because you have no clue what is linked to what anymore. Somebody's gonna move something, somebody's gonna break something, somebody's gonna change a project setting where net names do not cross sheet boundaries, you get broken nets, don't do it. Use wires, buses, name your wires, name your buses. The moment it goes off sheet, it goes through a port. At a higher level, ports are wired together. So you can have you have a clear visibility of what is touching what. You can actually follow follow the wires. Don't it, it's you're not gonna break anything in, uh, by accident. Uh, use your power objects um, for you know if you're gonna do power distribution, those can those can actually Depending on project settings, I typically use those. They cross sheet boundaries. So there's no point in you know VCC and ground. Ground is ground, unless you have a, a, a partition designer where you have multiple grounds. But then typically you're going to have ground one, ground two, ground. You're going to label them differently. Uh, graphics. This is a, a big thing because junction dots do tend to disappear when you print them, scale them, photocopy them, or take them with you in the lab where you have to do some work on a board and, and troubleshoot a board, and you're trying to look at something that was drawn originally on a 11 by 17 and is now on a scale to an eight and a half by 11, is, it, is that thing supposed to be connected or not? Is the dot there, yes or no? Golden rule, junctions need to be unambiguous. Meaning, it's always a T-junction. This is always, you have one wire, you have one going in. That's clear, this is connected. Anything that crosses is never a junction. Whether that dot is there or not there, that the intent does not change. So if you're gonna draw your schematics, this is a big no-no, because that dot may disappear in the scaling. If you draw like that, it's never gonna go wrong. <coughs> So this is again, for the computer it doesn't matter, but what, I'm, what, I'm, what I might talk here about is what happens outside of your CAD environment. You're going to interact with other machines that are going to understand that, but the human who has to hand solve your first prototype 
and forgot his glasses today, we have a problem with that. Okay, so just don't do that. Uh, same thing with these uh, these little hopovers. That is also an option you can follow along. Don't use that because if somebody has a setting different in his tool, those hopovers become crosses, and depending how it was originally drawn you can force the tool to create a junction that you do not want. The way that can happen is if you do the following. You'd start by drawing a wire and you terminate that wire somewhere in the middle of the page because you're still working in this area. I'm going to finish this later on. And now you start coming from here and you draw another wire. I'm happy. Well, for the computer, this wire terminates here that wire terminates there it does understand that it's the same connection but what happens if later on in your schematic you come with a third wire and you cross exactly in that point the dot does appear it is a junction point you didn't intend it to be you wanted to cross but it became a junction point because the computer said this endpoint and that endpoint coincide with this wire so there should be a dot here that does happen. Fortunately, starting in Altium 16, they have a new algorithm. If you actually terminate a wire here and you come with another wire from here, the tool does not create an end and a start point here. It fuses these two into a continuous line. But in older versions of the tool, it's not a guarantee. So here again, what happens is sometimes you have something that is drawn in an older version of the tool because somebody doesn't keep his licenses up to date and still uses, you know, Protel 99, which so many people in China still do. And then you import such a design in Altium 19, and boop, there's three dots that appeared. You don't know, because you never got to see the original drawing in 99. You see how Altium 19 renders it, and you think, oh, the dot needs to be there. And if you're going to do that layout now, you're going to be in, in problem because you've just shorts appear that are not supposed to be there. So be wary, be wary of those things. Uh, don't, if you don't, if you always assume that a cross is never a junction, when you look at that schematic sheet, it's going to become very, how come there's a dot there? I should question that because they did, personally they did something weird or we have an import problem. Just by looking at your schematics, you will be able to pick those things up. If you use these things as a rule. Uh, the real world. And again, this is what my intent with this presentation was, is that industrial machinery has a very long lifespan. Industrial machinery is very expensive. Those multi-head drill machines cost a lot of money. It needs to be amortized over many, 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 many years. Okay, that system that you're seeing right there is still running on the PDP-8 and is using 5-bit paper tape for its coordinates. That machine was decommissioned last year. From a big company here in the Bay Area. That's what you're dealing with when your data is leaving the door. You stick columns, percentages, backslashes, forward slashes in there that paper tape is gonna go nuts. And you're gonna get a phone call from your fabricator, we have issues. If you have a design that is on the critical path, and that happens on a Friday evening when nobody is around to pick up the phone, you just got three days to delay on your board. Don't do it. Sanitize your data. Keep it simple, you know, and it's not just, you know, there's pick and place machines, optical inspection, flying probe testers, some of these machines are on Linux, some are Unix based, some are Solaris based, some are still running on HPV. Uh, I mean, a lot of this, these machines are old because they just have a long lifespan and you do, you, you know, keep it simple. That is, that is the big, and, and all these things that I'm highlighting is stuff that I have personally run into where you have to spend a whole day figuring out what the hell is going on? And then you find out that, oh, it's because there is some character that that machine doesn't understand. What do we do now? If you try to fix it in the library so that the engineers don't have to deal with it, and that was the goal when we started at Tesla 
having a vault installation. We are now, knock on wood, at a point where we got 17,000 parts in our library, unique parts. I can build a board with any of these parts by just pulling a symbol out of the library, making my schematic, making sure my schematic is nice and clean, run it through layout. The layout people will do the layout, they will spit out a bill of material and it will go in production, zero questions asked. Because the libraries are clean. They are proven to mesh with the PLM system with purchasing with somebody who has an Excel spreadsheet managing some other data with uh, reliability tool chains like Sherlock, um, Inovia, uh, CST Studio, um, what's the, the, the guys that do the power analysis, ANSYS, yeah. Unsoft ANSYS, it works with Katia, it works with SolidWorks, it works with Creo. Yeah. We can go, so we mesh with so many different tools. It plays nice if you keep it simple. And yes, because we, we, we took the deliberate thing to keep everything simple because we do not know when that data set leaves the, the, the PCB designer's computer, we do not know where it's going to end up. We do not know what the manuf I mean, on a manufacturing shop floor, people use Valor, they have frontline Genesis, or they use UCAMCO to parse the, the, the Gerber data. You don't know what is going to be treating your data. Keep things simple to avoid the, the phone call, or even worse, not getting a phone call and ending up with something that is wrong because. So, in short, that's another thing. People making photocopies of photocopies of photocopies, and then you end up with schematics that look like that on paper. Well, good luck figuring out if you have to service that board what the intent was over there. <laughs> because that is it. Um, one more minute. So that's another another thing. Okay. And then the last thing. <laughs> don't make designs like that. <laughs> you don't want to do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was wrong. So I just got to remind you, please help out and throw your trash in the, in the cans over here. You cannot leave here without an escort, so make sure you have Brian or Umar or Chuck escort you out. We'll go out in groups together. <laughs> yeah. um, the next meeting will be October 24th, hosted by Zukin and Kyle Pilot. Kyle Pilot is uh, paying for the lunch. Zukin is hosting the meeting. We have the topic, Best Practices for RF and Mixed Technology PCB Design by Scott Nance, Director of PCB Layout from Optimism Design Associates. Let me thank Umar and the Amazon crew. Appreciate you for hosting us. The uh, Altium for providing lunch. Thank you very much. Steve, thank you for your uh, presentation. And thank you, Vincent.